as uh, well represented traditionally in the medical literature. So I know this is going to be, you know, changing over time, and I think it has changed to some degree, but there's definitely more focus on, you know, women's health overall. So that's why I wanted to have this panel, and this will be part one. We're definitely going to have more. Uh, Marna, per her schedule, couldn't join us today, but she'll be on the next one. So look forward to having her there. And of course, you see Jen on here and Dr. Toy on here as well. So welcome, everyone. Uh, great to see everyone. Um, and then we're going to be talking about our community updates first. So we know about, um, you know, COVID-19 pandemic is still happening. So I like to do research updates every week. Um, this, these are the, the recent updates. So there was an Oxford study that was over 4,000 people that showed that in a medication that's used very commonly for asthma called budesonide, which is a steroid, was associated with reduced duration of COVID-19 symptoms. And actually, I think people had about three days less symptoms if they, if they were um, treated with this budesonide, which is an anti-inflammatory. Um, that's one study that was just um, recently published. Another study from the Center for Disease Control showed that both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine in over 35,000 pregnant women was safe and without any significant adverse side effects. I think that's very useful and information to know for, you know, if you know someone that's pregnant or know, you know, uh, you might be pregnant yourself and wondering about the safety. And that was the initial concerns back in January. But we know that now that this is, you know, a lot of people have gotten the vaccine and it seems to be very safe in pregnant women per um, at least what we know at this point. Um, we also know that there's a new, new coronavirus variant detected. This just happened yesterday in Texas called the BV1 Brazos Valley. And this combines genetic markers separately associated with rapid spread, severe disease, and high resistance to neutralizing antibodies. Of course, these are not good things. Um, this is just one person. But um, you know, there are you know, variants kind of keeping on pop, popping up here. So I did a little more research. And um, recently, there was a, uh, two cases of breakthrough infections that were seen in fully vaccinated individuals. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But the cases were mild, and they didn't have to go to the hospital. And the CDC is estimating that about 5,800, I know this has been a question before, if people get vaccinated, can they get another infection? And the answer is definitely yes. But you can see on this on the uh, slide that that really, based on the CDC information, only one out of every 13,000 people would get would get infected if they already were fully vaccinated. And I think it might be more than that based on the the, the case studies with the New England Journal, because I think that was two out of out of 400 some people. But that's still a pretty low amount and the cases are typically mild. So that that's just information that hopefully was helpful for you. Um, from a perspective of other medications that might be helpful for COVID, there are um, there is something called the Together Together trial that's happening now, and you can look at that website if you're interested. Called TogetherTrial.com, there are certain medications like this antiparasite medicine that's used as an antiviral called ivermectin. There's a diabetes medicine called metformin that also reduces inflammation that is also being tri trialed for treatment of COVID. And so that's an ongoing trial and the results have not been released yet. And then of course we have our irritable bowel uh, syndrome awareness month this month in April because it's IBS awareness month. And so Jen and I have been doing a group visit series which has been really fun to do uh, with Jen here uh, on reflux, bloating and gas, constipation. And then the last one for this month is on food sensitivities which is gonna be next Tuesday at 1.30. We also have in May coming up a series on hormones, again, more for prevention to optimize your health, et cetera. And I think we're gonna start with thyroid, right, Jen? Is that right? Thyroid? Yeah, uh, it's on the next slide. Oh, so okay, <laughs> got, it, got it, got it, okay. He ahead of, so we have thyroid, we're gonna make them an hour instead of half an hour, just have more time. But um, thyroid, adrenals, estrogen and progesterone and testosterone and DHEA. If you can stay for the whole time, great. If you can stay for at least part of it, you know, that's fine too. We can, uh, I think we can give you the, rec or are we giving the recordings afterwards for these or no, no? Uh, the slides. Just the slides, okay, yeah, that's fine. So hormones I know is a big topic, you know, for, for everyone as well. So that's why that was kind of planned there. So we're looking forward to that, that should be a lot of fun. And then this has been the um, April, it's been a great month. We've had a lot of people come on. Dr. Kogan started out with integrative geriatrics. We had Dr. Kessler come on to talk about biological medicine from Switzerland. And then we had Emil come on, a certified ergonomics assessment specialist, talk about optimizing ergonomics, in which case that reminds me to sit up straight here um, during this uh, Zoom. 
And then today is our women's health panel. And then with Dr. Toyan, and then now we, uh, next Friday, actually we have uh, Dr. Anu French, who's a fellowship classmate of mine, friend of mine, that is gonna be talking about building resilience, especially through cultivating a work-life balance and some of the art and music that she, projects that she's been uh, doing as a physician, as an integrated physician. So it's pretty cool. She's gonna be doing hers next Friday at April 30th, so not the Thursday uh, based on her schedule. So, so Friday, April 30th, that's gonna be a different time. Um, a different date rather, it's, I think it's the same time, 12 to one, right? Is that right? Okay. So that'd be a thriving Fridays, but uh, today's a women's health panel. Um, I think we can kind of go to some questions if you have them already. I mean, we really want this to be very participatory here. So if you um, have any specific questions about women's health and you want us to, all three of us to you know, chime in, just feel free to put in the chat box there. Um, we can start with how to support irregular cycles. Um, I don't know if maybe Jen or Dr. Twain, you want to start out, lead us off with that? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> happy to. Um, so, you know, in terms of irregular cycles, one of the things that we think of um, is, you know, just imbalance in the hormones. Um, the main hormones involved in sort of the menstrual cycle are estrogen and progesterone. And um, in terms of the number, like of when you think about, you know, either PMS or irregular cycles, like it tends to be either like what we call estrogen um, dominance. Um, and the idea is to get, for however much estrogen you have, you wanna have enough progesterone to um, make sure that um, while the estrogen builds up this um, lining of the, of, the, um, of the uterus, progesterone um, um, does sort of, you, there needs to be enough balance to have that regular buildup and then shedding of the lining. Um, in order for that to happen, um, in terms of balancing this, there are a number of things that I think maybe Jen might want to talk more a bit more in terms of like seed cycling. Um, there's Vitex, there's Chaseberry. Um, there, there are a number of things, you know, including exercise. Um, but I might let Jen talk maybe a bit more about the nutrition piece first and bounce back. Yeah, I think one thing that's a kind of a good place to start as well is just what is an irregular cycle. And um, I think, I don't know if this is true for everyone, but a lot of females, I think, don't uh, track their cycle necessarily. And they just don't really even know like when their cycle's coming, how long is it? So that's at least a good starting point. But as far as um, regulating it with food, seed cycling is something that you can use as a supportive tool. Um, I'd be curious if anyone on here has done seed cycling, you can write that in the chat, but it essentially targets the seeds that help to support the hormones that need to be elevated at the right time. So like Dr. Twain was talking about um, the first half of the cycle, you want to have higher estrogen, the second half, higher progesterone. Um, so the first half of the cycle, and this would be from the first day of the period to the midpoint or when you're ovulating, um, you do pumpkin and flax seeds, and ideally you do one tablespoon of freshly ground uh, seeds. So you don't want to just be eating the seeds whole. Um, you can either use like a coffee grinder or actually recently heard from a patient that there are um, people out there that sell these seeds in packets already freshly ground for you to use. So you don't have to go through the process yourself um, targeted for seed cycling. So you can look into that if you want. But you do pumpkin and flax for the first half of the cycle, one to two tablespoons um, of each of those a day. And then the second half of the cycle are the two, uh, I think of them as the two S's, sunflower and sesame seeds. And that helps to increase progesterone. So that would be helpful if you have an irregular cycle or just if you're trying to um, balance estrogen and progesterone as well. So it's at least a starting point. Yes, and Jenna had a question about um, for teenagers, um, are irregular cycles a reason for concern in teenagers? Uh, any any thoughts about that? So um, it depends, teenage, that's a wide range, right? So um, depending on when your um, first menstrual, when you get your first menstrual cycle, that first year can be very irregular. Um, and that, so I would not worry about that at all. Um, um, you may miss a few per a period here or two, it may be longer, it may be light, it, may, it varies in that first year. But really from like, you know, 
after you've had like two or three years of like a cycle, there should be some sort of pattern that emerges. Um, ideally, like, you know, a regular cycle is anywhere from 20, usually approximately 28 days, but people do vary, um, but you do wanna have some consistency. If you're noticing that you're still having irregular cycles, I definitely think um, you'd want your teenager just to be checked out, like, because there are things like um, PCOS, PCOS, polycystic ovarian um, syndrome, that could um, be a reason for um, irregular cycles. Um, you also want to make sure that, you know, they're not dealing with things like eating disorders or like over-exercising, things that can throw the, um, what they call the hypothalamic um, pituitary axis off, which is just basically your brain talking to your ovaries, telling your body what to do with the cycle. So um, first year, basically first year, to maybe even up to three, okay, but if that still continues, you definitely want to get to the root cause of why that could be happening for your teenager. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what Dr. Twain said, and, and it sounds like the, the, the message here is, the message here is really balanced, right? Having the hormones balanced so that there's not too much estrogen, not too much, too little progesterone, that the hypothalamic hormones are working correctly, including the GnRH uh, hormone, because basically if someone's not, uh, not, not eating enough, you know, they might, like, like Dr. Twain said, that's really important in a teenager is, is you want to make sure they don't, they're not, they're not just, um, you know, intentionally not eating, you know, kind of like an eating disorder kind of picture because that would definitely send that message to the hypothalamus to say it's not safe to have a period right now because I'm underweight or something. Um, and then I guess the other things we would also look at, of course, from a functional perspective are looking at thyroid, you know, things like that, looking at maybe prolactin levels if needed. Um, there's even, even been some people with gut issues that have celiac disease that, that will turn out to be the cause of irregular cycles. Um, so th that's so, sort of broad and certainly the PCOS, like Dr. Twain mentioned, um, yeah, the seed cycling, uh, we had a question about that too. Is seed cy cycling safe while nursing? Is that safe? You know, that's an interesting question. I think one of the things we always run into with pregnancy and nursing is there's not a lot of research around that because no one necessarily wants to volunteer to do the research on it, uh, such a situation that can be delicate. So there's not a lot of research on it, but um, I think that's something you'd want to work with um, like your OBJYN or your practitioner on, but I mean, it is food-based. So. It's food. Yeah. It <laughs> should be. Yeah. And unless uh, I guess you could always overdo it on anything, right. And if you like a pound of seeds and it's probably not good, but yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think also like, I mean, you want to take into consideration, like, depending also where you are in terms of your, um, how soon postpartum. Mm -hmm. So after you've just given birth to the baby, like the nat the whole point of seed cycling is to sort of to mimic your natural like cycle, like the estrogen goes up and the, but that's not happening when you've just given birth. Like you do, you have prolactin, you have all, a lot of stuff going into making breast milk. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, and you're not most people don't get their periods back until like a couple of months after post after delivering. So I wouldn't like, you know, if you want to incorporate seeds, I, I would say go ahead, but don't, I wouldn't like follow that sort of like, you know, two weeks and then until maybe when you start bleeding again, you start having a cycle, then you can say, oh, mm -hmm. I'm going to get a cycle back on, but I wouldn't let that be a focus. There's loads of other things to think about postpartum. That's yes, a great point. That, that's a great point. Yeah, kind of mimic the natural rhythms when it's when the period is returning. That would make sense. Holly had a question about seed cycling. And one more question about that. Um, is it a good idea for someone who's approaching menopause? She was saying she's uh, 55 and has noticed some some cycle changes. Some months are heavier. Some are lighter. Um, you know, I think we're going to, we're, we're going to have, we have a slide on perimenopause too, mm -hmm. but, um, but in terms of seeds, at least, uh, is that, would that be okay for, I think, it, yeah, go ahead if you want to. Go ahead, Jen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it could be supportive. It's actually somewhat similar to the breastfeeding scenario because your hormones are just, there's lots of changes happening. So it may be helpful at certain times and not as helpful during other months, um, but I do think that you could use uh, parts of it. So like the progesterone component tends to be an issue for a lot of women. So focusing on the seeds that are progesterone supporting like the sesame and sunflower could be a good place to start. Um, and the other thing about seed cycling is that the moon 
is another way to kind of coordinate your cycle. So if you have like truly really irregular cycles, can't predict it at all, you can use the moon as like, if you want to say it's the full moon, this is day one, because um, the, the moon cycle is 28 days. So it's kind of some interesting uh, history about oh, that. Oh, cool. That's cool. Well. Yeah. But um, anyway, so if you have super irregular cycles, you could match it that way as well. Yeah, and that's that's great. All right, well we can uh, we can go on to the next uh, topic unless just Twain, Twain you have a question. Yeah. About, oh, yeah, yeah. Just one other thing uh, about Tom, how yeah. I looked at the first part about irregular cycles. Also around, and I know we're going to get to menopause, but around menop perimenopause and menopause, having irregular cycles, almost like when in the beginning, is also totally normal. So having heavier periods and lighter periods and skipping a period and just being like, what's going on? That is part of the getting into menopause phase too. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's a great point. Um, and um, we're going to stick with periods for this slide here, how to address premenstrual syndrome. Uh, first of all, um, I, I want to make a philosophical point about some of these you know, women's health topics of, of PMS and even menopause. Um, and and I, I'm curious to, to know what both of you think of this, especially as women and also people that are listening and participating here as, as many of you are women. I feel like a lot of this, and maybe I'm saying this not politically correct, but I feel like a lot of the patriarchal sort of traditional ways of diagnosis, kind of like with PMS or menopause and their diseases, but maybe they're not. It's just the way that they're kind of labeled. What are your thoughts about that? <laughs> I think I agree. I think I agree. Peter Patriarch and just the nature of medicine, I think we tend to, you know, group things for the sake of, but if you look at PMS alone or menopause alone, it's so many, so many different symptoms, right? And so many, and not everyone is going to manifest those symptoms. I prefer to think of it as, you know, looking at your body's trying to talk to you as it does with many other symptoms. It's like, okay, so you're having breast tenderness or bloating. Why is that? Is it like you know, your estrogen is out of balance? What can we do? Yeah. Is, apart from, you know, and obviously there's supplements and things we can do. There's fiber. We can work on getting that balance, but also being like your cup size goes up for some people, up, up mm. by one size. Mm -hmm. So maybe you need to get a new bra during that time. Your body's mm -hmm. telling you um, maybe you need to, you know, like magnesium helps. Maybe you need to eat more of this. Um, so I, I look at, I try I try to look at symptoms, including PMS and menopause, as more of like the body's trying to tell you maybe you need more self care. Like right, yeah. right, and that that that's huge. Yeah, the I can completely agree with that because I think a lot of like PMS and menopause, it's like something is wrong with you, right. and it's like first of all, your body's trying to tell you something, and especially with period symptoms, I think they're often seen as normal, and um, a lot of them are just signs that your body's trying to tell you something, and. Um, with menopause, I think it's also kind of like overlooked, like no one really talks about menopause, but it's like a totally, like, you could almost say like a whole spiritual, uh, something to go through. I haven't gone through it myself, but just knowing what I know about it. Uh, so it's, it's just a time of big change and it's important to acknowledge that for both ends of the spectrum. Um, so anyway, there's a, there's a podcast, I think it's called ancestral wellness, I believe. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll go back and look. Um, but um, there, there's a, a group from South America, actually, that um, has a podcast called Ancestral Wellness. And, and on their, uh, their mom is talking about how when they're growing up in, in South America, you know, traditional, a traditional society with a lot of women uh, that are kind of coaching all the girls that are like going through that, you know, the first part of having their period, and then all through like menopause and things like what to expect. And so, it, it becomes like a regular part of the ritual of life as opposed to like a abnormal medical condition that we must treat or something like that. So just check out that podcast if you're, if you're interested. Um, uh, we should segue to one thing that uh, Kelly Ann said here um, on that regular cycle slide that we have. Um, as far as heavy periods, is there any natural alternative to uh, tran tranexamic acid, uh, which is basically a medicine for irregular cycles. I, I want to kind of zoom out for a second and just say that for irregular cycles or PMS, then then we always want to start with lifestyle, right? Is where's where the stress? You know, where's the nutrition? You know, how's the how's the movement? You know, how, you know, what's the mind body kind of practices that? Oops, sorry. Uh, how do I get back to that? Okay. Uh, in other words, what what are the things that that are going to be supporting? that that person's body and so that that things are you know so that we're, we're basically telling our body hey we're listening to you you know 
so um, yeah, what are any other natural alternatives? Yeah, to tranexamic trans, acid. Yeah, um, you know, for a regular cycle, certainly trying to balance the hormones, things like seed cycling, um, but probably certain nutrients too. You know, B vitamins, magnesium, and then like the stress, the lifestyle pieces too. Yeah, I think it also, that's where it goes like individualized and like for you, why do you have heavy periods? You know, what's the root cause? And I know um, a lot of times it is related to the estrogen ratio to progesterone. So yeah. there are um, some herbs that can be very helpful with that. And another component of PMS is everyone kind of talks about the actual period, like the bleeding portion of it as like the thing everyone knows about, but ovulation is extremely important to have a healthy cycle. So most women don't even know if they're ovulating unless they're trying to get pregnant. So knowing if you're even ovulating successfully can really help with um, estrogen levels being in better in ratio to progesterone. And just as a, another general point before we kind of go on to, to more of uh, PMS, inflammation is going to increase estrogen dominance. So estrogen is good. Too much estrogen in relation to progesterone, probably not good in terms of, you know, some of these symptoms that might be cropping up. But what's driving that estrogen dominance, it's often related to either systemic inflammation, gut inflammation, things like that. And so you have to look at the root cause like we're kind of talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, I love this point from Holly. Yeah, the nature of Western medicine has been disease oriented, right? Disease, disease management versus healthcare, right? I mean, we call it a healthcare system, but uh, we won't get into that right now, but <laughs> uh, that whole, uh, but I, th I think that whole idea of, you know, how can we prevent uh, disease, how can we optimize wellness, how can we optimize health? Um, yeah, it is, it has been a historically male dominated profession, uh, tends to look down on women. Um, that's why we're all here, I think, in this practice, because we want it to definitely be much more of a, you know, I, I guess, um, a process that's much more open and, and much more, you know, um, you know, looking at kind of the whole picture instead of a narrow-minded focus. So yeah, I, I love that comment. Thanks, Holly. Uh, Dana, hey, hey, Dana, great to see you here. Um, what can you share about large blood clots when bleeding during the cycle? Large blood clots. Uh, do you want to take that maybe? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, the, I mean, there are different reasons. Typically when we see clots, it tends to be for like heavy bleeding. So um, one of the things that um, I would um, recommend, because a lot of women, when, when we ask like, oh, how heavy are your, are your periods? And some people are like, oh, you know, moderate. I was then follow up by asking like how many pads or tampons or how often are you changing a diva cup? Because that um, like some people have just their families, they all have heavy bleeding. And like for them, heavy bleeding with clots is just part of their, you know, what they're used to. So they'd be like, oh, that regular, but for a lot of other people that's heavy. So um, blood clots, at least the way I was trained was sort of a sign of like, you know, heavier bleeding. And again, sort of like, depending on your estrogen um, balance and whether you have fibroids, whether like it can be a sign that of something that needs to be worked up more. I don't know if, and I don't know if, Dr. Wong, you know this, if it has anything to do also with like clotting factors, I haven't, I'm not aware of any association with that, but. Um, um, yeah. I'm, I'm not aware of that. I think probably with that estrogen progesterone balance, then, then people are bleeding and then the body's just trying to clot, you know, so then it's probably a normal, you know, the, the probably normal factor five and, you know, all these different things in terms of coagulation, it's probably just the body's natural way to, to just stop the bleeding so that someone doesn't bleed too much. I, I don't know of any other association between that and some genetic abnormalities. I know from a nutrition standpoint that um, reducing inflammation, as Dr. Wong said, that's really at the end of the day what a lot of this comes down to as far as the food component. Um, but omega-3s can be helpful for uh, the heavier cycles and blood clots and uh, with the period. So you can, of course, do omega-3 supplements, fish oil, that kind of thing, or things like flax seeds, walnuts can be helpful. Um, just as something to consider as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's some questions on menopause or postmenopause. We'll get to them, I think. We're gonna have a slide on, on that too. Um, so yeah, um, and then do you ever use HRT, hormone replacement therapy to, I think I might've misread that, uh, that question. Uh, definitely we use it for menopause in terms of severe PMS symptoms. I probably wouldn't use it for, for that, um, I guess conventionally there is, you know, I know that GYNs will use 
uh, conventional birth control, I, I think that's, you know, that is an option. It is certainly a respectful option and it's something that is conventionally accepted. Um, I, I personally don't use that in my practice and my patient panel, but I'm not sure if you do, Dr. Toyan. Um, I think it's certainly reasonable, but it's not something that, you know, I would do. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if, by like, I mean, birth control. You mean birth control? Amanda, do you mean birth control or do you mean hormone replacement? Because that's a little different. Birth control is an accepted option. I think that's what we tried to, yeah. So yeah. birth control will not be C, oh, but okay. Um, I haven't used bioidenticals myself in practice for, for PMS. I mean, A, because you're, you're still menstruating, right? So you're, you still have hormones. So it's adding more gassing to the fire. If the fire is related to inflammation and you're just giving more hormones, that, that doesn't really do much in terms of uh, you know, symptoms. I think if someone is premenopausal and maybe in their, their 30s or 40s and they're struggling, they have low progesterone only, and, and progesterone does decline uh, naturally around age 35 in the luteal phase. So in theory, you could do some either bioidentical progesterone or even, even prescription progesterone uh, just for progesterone. But I would certainly wouldn't do it for estrogen. That, that wouldn't make any sense there. But that's a good question, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we would be concerned about the risk of like what that extra additional hormones. Yeah, like yeah. Breast cancer. Yeah, you're increasing the risk there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, um, anything else on PMS before we move on to the next? I think uh, kind of going back to the estrogen idea, um, something that is also important is that it's not necessarily that you're making too much estrogen. Uh, it's sometimes that you can't get rid of it properly. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that comes to liver health and how you metabolize that. But from nutrition standpoint, any uh, vegetables that are sulfur based are really helpful and specifically things like broccoli or broccoli sprouts can be very helpful. So it just kind of underlines the more reason to include vegetables and in particular, the leafy green cruciferous vegetables could be helpful to balance Bro that. Broccoli is our friend. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Um, all right. So we'll go to go to another topic here. Fertility. Um, fertility is uh, definitely a, another hot topic. And you see this person's very excited about uh, getting pregnant here the, the, in the picture. Um, how, do, how do we support fertility? What are some good you know, uh, ways to do that? Uh, maybe natural health ways, things like that. I think from nutrition side, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things. And yeah. um, one thing that maybe would be interesting for us to talk about is just prenatals. Cause I think um, a lot of women will start prenatals like as they're pregnant, but I, Think it is actually important to be on for uh, be on a prenatal um definitely as you're planning to get pregnant um or just you know within the months around that time because it, you do need to make sure you have the nutrient levels where they need to be so that you can have successful pregnancy and healthy pregnancy like that so um that's at least a starting point yeah um, and and really health a healthy baby starts preconception right i mean that's sort of what the idea of the epigenetics of the mother and father or, you know, basically the parents um, affecting the embryo, even like preconception is now the new kind of, I guess, target, you know, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, any, any other thoughts, Dr. Twain, about fertility issues? Yeah, and and so just in line with sort of the idea of like, you know, a couple of months before, I know there's a, you know, tendency, you know, just given our like diet culture and like, you know, tend to obsess on like just food and nutrition. Um, so like, a couple of months before pregnant when you're trying to but it's not the time to go on some you know yeah. go diet or you know because for a couple of reasons one um when you make significant changes your body perceives that as okay this isn't safe to have a child so it can affect your cycles and your ovulation um it can also if you metabolize a lot of your if you mobilize a lot of your fat so if you lose a lot of weight there are a lot of toxins and things that have been stored in our fat that can come out and can affect your ability um, to um, conceive. So, you know, no, time when you're trying to get pregnant is the time to really, like when you talk about self-care, self-care, because sleep also, um, if you're not sleeping well, your cortisol levels will be out of balance, your melatonin and all that affects your fertility. So it should really be a time of like, um, you know, rest, like eating for nourishment, dealing stress management, um, you know, all the good things. <laughs> yes. And, and yeah, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jens. Okay. I just, I completely agree with that. Cause I think 
especially when you're trying to get pregnant, the body needs to feel safe to get pregnant and feel like it's a good idea to get pregnant. So if you're doing any extreme changes, it could affect your fertility. Um, the other thing uh, important there is just like lots of leafy greens. <laughs> I'm uh, really advertising for the greens today just for um, the B vitamins that are really important. Um, and then the other thing is healthy fats because your hormones ultimately back down the line are made from fats. So um, I think like the culture, at least in the last like 20 years has been very phobic of eating fat. And um, just remember that fats are super important, not only for your hormones, but then also the health of the baby and brain health and all that kind of stuff as well. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more about this in June because we'll have a brain uh, health series as well. But basically the brain is 60% fat. So if you think about that developing fetal brain, you're gonna need a lot of that DHA and EPA, especially DHA. So you really want to get at least 500 milligrams of DHA if you're pregnant, or even like it's like Dr. Tony said, load up before that, like Jen said, load up before that, get the nutrition, get the lifestyle kind of more squared away before then, uh, before you have a baby. The other thing about stress is that cortisol itself will affect the babies, the fetal hippocampus. So you can actually have cortisol receptor resistance. You can have essentially the baby primed to have a lifetime, although, you know, I think that can be changed with with lifestyle, you know, uh, their own lifestyle too, but the baby can get set up to have, you know, chronic stress from the mom, let's say, or, you know, prenatally can, can actually lead to things like obesity and heart disease and all these other things down the line. So it's actually really important to, um, to do the yoga, to do the mind body techniques, to do all the lifestyle techniques that you need. It's going to be a really good investment for your, for your baby. Um, fertility. We also think about, and, and we've had a number of patients here that have had infertility, let's say. Um, so we always like to look at um, metabolic issues, you know, make sure that insulin resistance is, is addressed, you know, um, blood sugar issues are addressed. And then of course, hormone issues would be the same as, you know, is there enough estrogen in the ovulation phase? Is there enough progesterone to keep that embryo in the luteal phase? And then certainly thyroid is a big factor. A lot of times people have low thyroid or subclinical hypothyroidism, even when not detected by conventional labs, we'll do our full Kind of more functional panel, we'll, we'll see that they're actually functionally low and then put them on thyroid hormone or other thyroid treatment and then they get pregnant. So that, that's another big thing. Um, I think like we said also with the, with the detox, you know, making sure that things like plastics, BPA and things like that, which can also affect fertility because they're endocrine disruptors. They really uh, can affect fertility. And, and we know that both, I think, and then too, like sperm counts, I'm a guy, so I have to talk about male health, even though it's a woman's health panel. Um, you know, reduce sperm counts, reduce fertility in both males and females based on, off of the toxic load that we now all face increasingly. So that's a big factor too. We had Dr. Chrissy Williamson, who's a doctor of clinical nutrition, and a couple of weeks ago talk about methylation. So you can go back and look at Facebook and YouTube for that. But uh, methylation is a process by which biochemically, uh, methyl groups get transferred from, let like, say, folate to methylfolate, and that affects uh, detox and affects risk of blood clotting, but it also affects fertility. So that is another important piece is that if people have certain methylation genetics, they might be more susceptible to having infertility, and so that might be part of the workup that a fertility doc may do for you. Um, and then one, one last thing I would just say is that acupuncture has been really helpful for a lot of women to um, to, you know, deal with uh, fertility and basically get pregnant. So I know that in our practice, Liz Baird does do acupuncture for fertility. So if you're interested in that, you can contact Liz. I have one other thing to add, which is really applicable for fertility, but hormone health for anyone, males and females, which is thinking about your toxin exposure with endocrine disruptors. And these are things you can remember the four Ps, it's uh, plastics, pollutants, pesticides, and personal care products. So basically any place there could be chemicals. Um, some of them can really interrupt your hormones. And especially if you're working with menopause, PMS, fertility, those are really things to take a look at. And there's a great website um, from the EWG. Uh, it's called Skin Deep. I can try to put the link in here um, where you can actually look at uh, the products that you're using and especially the ones that go onto your body because things don't just uh, not come into your body. You know, the lotion rubs into your skin, it comes into your body and that can affect your hormones. So that's- I mean, I'm, I'm almost starting to think of the skin as a GI organ because you're basically nourishing your skin that, that's going into your body too. So you're, you're actually taking in those, you know, those, uh, you know, lotions and creams and things that, that are put on. That, that's another thing. So um, definitely- 
definitely the skin is really important. Um, yeah, they're great. Uh, yeah, acupuncture, thanks Dana, um, yeah, has had some experience both personally and from her friends uh, with acupuncture for fertility and irregular cycles. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, okay, so we'll go on because I know we have some other topics when I get to everything. How does stress affect women's health? Ooh, this is a big topic. You see the octomom here. This is uh, not even someone with eight kids, but they have eight tasks probably, so they're, they're still octomom. Um, yeah, this is a big topic. Uh, what, what is everyone, how, yeah, what, what are your thoughts about this? Stress and women's health. So um, we know that, <laughs> it's like justice. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually, I, I remember uh, I had a, a, a patient recently who, who was just like, she's like, I don't even want to talk about stress right now. It's like, like, how can you like, I'm like, stress is just like all, there all the time. It's part of life. I'm like, yes, it is a part of life, but it does not have to be. <laughs> um, there are ways to manage it. Um, and, and obviously there's no way you can get rid of stress completely. We need stress. It is an important part. That's how we get stuff done. It's an important, if we need to run anywhere, um, the stress hormones are important for normal function. But the issue comes when we're constantly like put under pressure, whether it's actual pressure or perceived pressure from the expectations from whatever society, what we expect from ourselves, what we expect, like what, what society expects of us. Um, and the issue is basically, so if you have this chronic stress, your body does produce a lot of cortisol, um, that which puts a lot of tax on, basically on your adrenals. And actually when we get to the menopause part, we probably talk a bit about this and like people, they found that, you know, when your adrenals are like sort of exhausted because you either, you make estrogen when your ovaries aren't making estrogen anymore, your adrenals kind of take over. And if you've basically spent your whole life sort of taxing your adrenals and waxing them out because where you're stressed, um, you can really have a lot more of the side effects of menopause. But that anyway, back to stress. Um, you know, once you get those stress hormones, you can really affect the impact of the production of your um, normal sex hormones because the adrenals make cortisol, but they also make estrogen and um, um, help make estrogen and progesterone. And if you're just so kind of like pumping out all this cortisol, then you're not gonna have your body, like there's only so much the body can do. And then that can cause a lot of imbalance. Um, that's from the physio perspective. Um, I'll, I'll stop talking for now, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> um, even in this picture, meditation is stressful. You see that she's thinking of the vacation on the beach here. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I think kind of, <laughs> it's kind of the thing like Dr. Toyin saying, like everyone knows stress is a problem. Um, I think with women in particular, I mean, this is true for men as well in a lot of cases, but they will put other people before themselves because we're just natural caretakers. And um, I think that's something to take a look at in your life of if that's true for you. And then remember the idea of you wanna put your air mask on yourself or your oxygen on yourself before your child um, mm -hmm. or anyone you're caring for in your life and really making self-care a priority when you're trying to work on your hormones. Um, it all kind of comes back to that safety idea. And if your body perceives that there's a lot of things that are stressful, the hormones are gonna be out of whack, so. Yeah, and, 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 and ideally get some assistance either from a partner or from a friend or someone, community member that can help you with some of these uh, tasks, you know, cause that's not, not doesn't, doesn't look fun to do all, all this all together. Um, but yeah, um, so yeah, I, I think I think there's many ways to you know deal with stress, of course, and that could be a topic for a whole nother webinar. So I think let's make sure we get to all the questions. Um, yeah, I know menopause. We can menopause. Yeah. All right, we're we're getting to that. Right, we're getting to that. So um, navigating bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So typically, this is in the perimenopausal and menopausal time period. So now we're kind of talking about what Audrey talked about. Um, you know, menopause. We have some questions on menopause. We have a menopause site right after this, but in terms of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, that is something we would consider on an individual basis after looking at someone's health goals and their health history and kind of, you know, regarding risk and benefits. Um, there was a study in the late 1990s called the Women's Health Initiative, and they looked at basically could um, could hormone replacement therapy, and they actually used Prempro, which is a estrogen and synthetic progestin or progesterone or progestin basically a synthetic hormone replacement 
to see if it would be helpful for things like reducing um, reducing heart attacks and you know things like and strokes and things like that. So it wasn't really used uh, initially for like would it help hot flashes or something like that. So I think there's been a lot of kind of back and forth about this over the last you know um, I, I guess yeah 20 plus years now you know about this. Um, so we would we would really say that you know I think the the biggest uh, takeaways are that. Um, there was a reanalysis of the WHI trial that was done in 2017. And this basically showed that bioidentical hormone replacement therapy was generally safe when taken for five to seven years, especially when started in the when starting at age in the in age 50s. Now, the interesting thing is that the average age in the initial study that was done in the 1990s of women that you know um, got bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, and there was this whole idea of, you know, bioidentical hormone replacement causes cancer, it increases the risk of heart disease, even and things like that. These, these women started bioidentical hormone replacement in the trials at age 63, which was 12 years post the average age of menopause, which is age 51. So really, when comparing like apples to oranges, you, that's not a fair comparison, right? Because I mean, starting at 63 is a much different ballgame than starting at age 51 or 52. Now we know that there is, I think, in theory, more risk at starting, you know, 10 plus years out of menopause because the estrogen receptors start shutting down after, after a bit, you know, if there's not as much stimulation from, from either the ovaries or the adrenals. And so if you take someone 10 plus years out and you put them on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy and their estrogen receptors are not ready to receive that estrogen, then, then we're going to have a problem with detox. Right, because the estrogen is going to flood the system, liver can't handle all that, and then some of the estrogen becomes inflammatory and increases the risk of breast cancer and other estrogen-dependent cancers. Does that make sense? So, um, so we we do check here, and then I'll I'll kind of be quiet for a bit. But um, BHRT, we really want to look at the effects of the bioidentical hormone replacement therapy when we do prescribe that with patients. We want to test that with the Dutch testing, which is a dry urine testing for conflict of hormones. And we have a slide on that as well, I believe, but that's going to tell us if it's if it's safe for you to start or continue that. Um, that's any other thoughts about BHRT? Um, anyone anyone want to share their um, thoughts about it? Either uh, listening would be fine too. Um, what are the benefits? Yes. Uh, well, if someone has early menopause, then then you're more we're more likely to start it, right? Because if the average age is 51, and someone has either premature ovarian failure or basically early menopause before age 51, you might start thinking, you know, let's think about the things that have been shown now in the literature to be helpful with regards to BHRT, which is basically four different benefits. Number one is going to be obviously relief of hot flashes and night sweats and things like that, vasomotor symptoms, vaginal dryness. But then you also think about number two, three, and four, which are going to be brain health. It would reduce the risk of dementia, heart health. It reduces the risk of heart attack and stroke, uh, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. And then, of course, number four would be bone health. So I think that would be, oh, sorry, scratching my jacket. Okay. Um, so, so bone health would be one. So someone that's, you know, has menopause at age 46, I think would be, someone, you know, we want to likely want to start bioidentical hormone replacement therapy on because that, that's a bit early and, and you're kind of exposing yourself to a lot of other downstream long-term risks, um, you know, if the hormone levels drop too quickly, too early. Is that better? Not scratch anymore? I don't know. Yeah, that's better. It was, it was just rubbing okay. on your jacket. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Well, it's cold in my house, so I'm just trying to... <laughs> Um, Amber has been taken, okay, bioidentical progesterone for 20 years plus. That, that is not inflammatory, no. That, that, is not, that would not be considered inflammatory. The risks, um, there have been some studies done. I think the Lancet was the most recent one in 2019, and it showed that there, there are some risks for both synthetic and more bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. Statistically, there's an odds ratio of, you know, there being an, in, there being an increased risk of estrogen-dependent cancers, things like breast cancer, endometrial cancer, with with uh, bioidentical or, or or synthetic hormone replacement therapy. So I think you have to really consult with your practitioner about that. Do some Dutch testing. Just understand the risk and benefits and make an educated decision. You know, for some people it will be fine. For other people, it will be more of a risk. So you have to. You know, you have to talk to your practitioner about that. 
that, that that's how we kind of look at it here. We're definitely not a you must do bioidentical hormone replacement for you know every single woman because that that's sort of a cookie cutter approach that I think misses a lot of the nuances that otherwise might be a healthier approach. Um, and as Toyin said, I think with the cortisol issue, you know, if someone's adrenals are off, then essentially you might actually might not need bioidentical hormone replacement therapy if your adrenals are working better because then they could actually make the estrogen still to some degree at least. Um, BHRT, yeah, I think those are the main points for BHRT. Uh, we'll get to the adrenal question, yeah, okay. Let's go to menopause because I know we want to get to that. Um, are we good on time, Jen? Are we good? Yep, it's 12.52. Oh, okay. Okay. So this, I know we're kind of, everyone's waiting for this. So uh, menopause, um, how do we navigate um, menopause and, and perimenopause? Um, maybe uh, Jen or Dr. Tony, you want to start? Yes. You go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead, Jen. Go ahead. So. Okay. I was just going to kind of echo, I think um, we had already kind of touched on this, just like changing the perspective on menopause is like something that's not really talked about. And, um, you know, the symptoms that are experienced, I think people just think it's like something that no one else will relate to. We don't talk about and just recognize it, that it's an important part of our life cycle. And it's uh, something I think to honor and to kind of change our perspective on. Um, and then also important to do the supportive things like the self-care and the supporting stress. Um, and just making sure you're honoring yourself. That's kind of what I'm trying to drive home here is a good place to start with menopause. Yeah, and um, sorry, I think my my internet had cut out at some point or I, I don't know, but I had also wanted to tie, you know, there was a comment about sort of being on bioidentical hormones and stuff for like 20 years. Um, one other thing I would just say sort of to think about with regards to things like that is that in general, um, the idea of bioidentical hormones like menopause is a transition right the same way sort of like you know getting a period is a transition time so the idea of like you know um depending on what your symptoms are you, you there are a lot of benefits of like replacing the hormones um but the idea of being on hormones and again it's very individual so like it may it may make sense for your individual case but i think um i would argue that we should challenge ourselves to really think about what we're addressing and how long um we're addressing it for because that's also how Sort of in the conventional medicine world people just start a medication and get just continue that medication because it's working but like what was the you know underlying issue and if it has been addressed can we then wean off um but any anyway, um to get back to the menopause like it is again a like pms loads of different symptoms and not everyone's going to manifest all of them and um depending on what your symptoms are whether it's some people just have vaginal dryness and there are many ways that we can, you know, address that, like either locally with like a suppository. Um, some people have, you know, a low libido, which is a more complicated, you know, topic that um, usually involves multiple um, things, not only just the loss in, um, not, it could be vaginal dryness, it could be the, you know, usually like a lot of changes in relationships. Um, so that's a lot more complicated. Some people's hair loss, some people difficulty sleeping. So. I think, you know, the idea, I know we just group it all together as menopause and like, you know, these are the common symptoms, but you definitely want to take that approach as like, what is my body trying to say to me? Is it an, it's, is it just the imbalance going on? For some people, there have actually been studies that show that when you deal with stress and people who are getting hot flashes, like the hot flashes go away. So mm -hmm. it's not just, it's not just, it, obviously there is the, the change in the hormones going on. But there's also, um, you know, I think we have a tendency to just be like, oh, it's the menopause. But what else is going on in your life? What are the triggers? What 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 things can we address like from a bigger like, you know, um, like lifestyle, um, you know? Yeah, yeah, that makes that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, one thing I actually found out recently that was interesting was that um, uh, during menopause as well, like because a lot of women have trouble sleeping and we found out that like, you know, um, Sort of like in the early stages of pregnancy when you're sort of flooded with hormones a lot of women sleep a lot and then in menopause you don't sleep as much um and that there's actually some effect obviously the the hormones on your ability to sleep and um but it also may affect like the estrogen and progesterone 
may have a protective effect against OSA, which is obstructive sleep apnea. So around that time of transition as well, you may want, if you're having difficulty sleeping, you may want to get screened for sleep apnea. Like- um, Oh, okay. So the lower amounts of hormones might actually predispose someone to have more of a risk of OSA. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So I, I, you know, um, just the idea of like, don't just be like, oh, I have menopause. I just want to, you know, mm -hmm. get, take supplements or I want to do, do just get rid of it. But what is causing, like your body is trying to tell you something. And I think working with your provider to figure that out, whether it's doing a touch test, the sleep apnea test, whether it's going through nutrition, like what, what it, or like mental mm -hmm. health and what stressors are happening. Um, I think. And just to get to Kelly's question on progesterone and menopause and how that would help. If the sleep study is negative and you're normal, I mean, and you don't have sleep apnea and, and you know, potentially progesterone could be beneficial in, in menopause and um, progesterone will increase GABA through a metabolite called allo uh, pregnant diol, which eventually goes to eventually goes to the GABA receptors in the in the in the brain cells, and and you can basically calm down the system and and help with sleep at least that way. I think besides that, um, would progesterone help in other ways um, for for menopause? I think a lot of a lot of it's more the estrogen really in terms of the uh, progesterone is kind of like a. a, a um, a complement to the estrogen because re really, as long as you, if, if you know, if you have a uterus, you want to make sure that if you take estrogen, you're protecting the uterus with the progesterone. If you take that, but if it's progesterone alone, a lot of times we can we can use that for things like anxiety and sleep issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. Let's see. Oh, did I? Let's see. Okay. Um, questions. Uh, is there any risk to taking? Progesterone only to help with sleep at night. I don't think so. Not that I can tell. Um, and we can do a Dutch test uh, on you too. I know we have a Dutch test uh, slide too. Yeah. Um, if you want more of a webinar on just menopause, let let us know here, and we could definitely do one on on just menopause because I know that's a big topic. So just put in the chat if you would like that. We can definitely uh, talk about it. Um, other other points about menopause, like I think we all said, menopause is not a disease; it's a part of life, life passage. Um, there are certain phytoestrogens, including ginseng, red clover, soy, and sage, that could be helpful, as well as non-phytoestrogen plants such as black cohosh and kava. So again, talk to your practitioner about this. Um, we also know about acupuncture, meditation, yoga can really help some of those, you know, to reduce stress and. Um, and then um, sometimes memory can get affected by low estrogen. So there's a herb called Bacopa that can be really helpful. And then from a primary care perspective, we know that with estrogen going down, cholesterol often goes up. So we want to check the lipid panel, the fasting lipid panel. We want to check people's bone density as well. We also here have a brain health scan. How many people have done that called the Evoke? So a lot of people have maybe have done that. Um, they can look at brain health. You can look at um, how your neurons are kind of firing a bit and a circulation scan called the vital scan. So these are all really potentially helpful, you know, kind of looking at um, it from an overall more holistic picture. Um, let's see. I just want to add quickly, okay. sorry. No, go ahead. That yeah. there are a lot of like herbal medicine approaches that I think can be helpful with menopause specifically. And that's, I think maybe if we do a webinar specifically on, what, on menopause, we can talk about those in detail. But um, that's definitely something you can work with a provider on and discuss if that is a good option for you. Um, yes, and Holly, so thank you all for the votes there. We'll, we'll definitely do one on menopause. Uh, everyone has spoken here. Um, as for future menopause-related webinars, yeah, topics of interest, so sleep disturbances, how to prevent dementia and maintain bone health. Yeah, those are great. We'll definitely do a webinar on that. Very exciting. Thank you so much for the idea. Um, how to test if the adrenals are off. I think that might go to the next slide. So some of the testing that we do, we can check a uh, blood tests for cortisol. It should be fasting and within an hour, if we do it that way, we can check DHEA and DHEA sulfate. Those are the three markers of the adrenals. We can check on LabCorp. On Dutch testing, we can do what's called a dried urine testing for conference of hormones, which is a functional test that is not covered by insurance because the lab doesn't take that, uh, take insurance, but um, it, it's a really good test to look at basically sex hormones and adrenal hormones, and then the metabolites of the sex hormones as well, because that can tell you about um, many things there, including uh, how your adrenals are working, how the uh, estrogen is being detoxed by the liver, and, and many other um, really uh, helpful 
uh, helpful helpful analytes, I guess we call it. So this is something we would recommend. Um, it's called the Dutch Complete Test, um, and then you, or you can start with the LabCore test as well. So I think it's like almost one. Yeah, it is one on one. Okay, so. Um, yeah, thank you so much for attending this today. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Dr. Coyne. Great to see everyone here. And uh, this has been a lot of fun. So we'll look forward to the next uh, webinar on menopause uh, coming up in the future uh, sometime this year. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.